that everything that, that everything that, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. That everything that, that everything that, that everything that has breath, praise the Lord. I praise you in the morning, I praise you in the evening, I praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing, praise you when I'm grieving, praise you every season of the soul. We could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love. Surely we would never cease to praise. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens, joining with the angels, praising you forever and a day. I praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, calling all the nations to your praise. We could see much your worth, your power, your might, your endless love. Surely we would never cease to pray. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, let everything that, let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
Make my heart cry Let me speak life Fulfill my heart Fill my soul Bring me Make my heart cry, let me speak life. I choose to praise, I choose to fill my heart with only you, so the thoughts that might destroy cannot take. my heart with only you that from the overflow of my heart I would speak like you I choose to praise I choose to fill my heart with only you so the thoughts that might destroy cannot take root I choose to fill my heart with only you That from the overflow of my heart I would speak like you That from the overflow of my heart I would speak like you The mountains shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name The angels will bow The earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth We will shout your name Filling up the skies With endless grace Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name Oh Lord Your name the morning breaks in glory At your name Creation sings your story At your name The angels will bow The earth will rejoice The people cry out We're singing, Lord of all the earth, we will shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. And there's no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you, there's no one like our God. Sing, sing, yeah, there's no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we will shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh. Love to shout your name, oh Lord. Oh Lord of all the earth, we will shout your name, filling up the 
skies with endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, proud to shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we will shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise. So glad that you could join us for church on line 2 Corinthians 4, summer of 2024, part two of this series. We're taking some time to reflect on 2 Corinthians 4. And uh, I just want to give us a quick recap. A couple of weeks ago, we started this series by asking this question What if this summer we decided to reflect God's glory in everything that we do? And remembering this idea that to reflect something is to show its image or mirror its image. As it relates to reflecting God's glory, we want to amplify His greatness so that the culture around us can see His magnific magnificence to make an invisible God visible to a world that is desperately searching for more. We concluded the service with the challenge to ask ourselves, the hard questions. What does your life reflect? I mean, what does my life really reflect? What do those in my sphere of influence, those around me, see when they see me living my life? I want to shift gears now and kind of head towards where we're going today. And we're not quite there yet, but I want to head towards there. When something extraordinary happens, you naturally want to share it with others. The joy is infectious, whether it's a promotion, a good health report, or an academic achievement. Our faith, the good news, the gospel, if you will, is the most beautiful thing that has ever happened to us. Shouldn't we be just as eager to share it? Our life, your life, my life, especially our faith, was meant to be shared with others. This is not just for all the extroverts who are watching today, but also for all of the introverts as well. When we share our faith, we're, we're not just sharing a personal experience, although that might be part of it, but we're building a community of believers who can support and encourage one another. It's not just for us. It's, uh, it's not just for us as individuals. It's for us as a whole, a community. So here's some questions to consider. Why is it so difficult for us to share the good news? Why is it so difficult for us to share the gospel message with those who need to hear it? Why is it so challenging for us to share sometimes what God has done in our lives with others? Let's jump into 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to read verses 3 to 6. That'll be our focus here today. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Pretty powerful verse right there. Let's jump in and continue on in verse 5. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves, Paul says. We uh, preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said this in verse 6, Let there be light in darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God who is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, I want to take a few moments just for some background before we cover ground today. So let's go backwards before we move forward. Maybe you're listening today and you've heard the words gospel or good news already in this message, but you're not exactly sure what that means. For example, if someone asked you to give them a 27-second synopsis, you'd say, well, that's really specific, and I'm not even sure where to begin. Would you even know where to begin? So I wanna, I'm not going to share everything about the gospel today, but I'm going to share a couple of things real quick. 
to kind of give us some foundation. The gospel is the power of God at work to save. Romans 1 verses 16 and 17 say, For I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. The good news of the gospel is the central message of Christianity. It includes the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which provides salvation for all who believe. Let's uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. Let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you... and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what has been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried, he was raised, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. These are kind of uh, two passages that kind of help encapsulate what the gospel is. The foundation or the goal of the gospel is that Christ's glory will be revealed in such a way that sinners would renounce their old ways and turn to God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in need of a Savior. All right, with that, it's time for us to jump forward into the message today. Uh, In particular, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 6. The first thing I noticed as I was studying and reflecting on these verses is that uh, there are different perspectives on what is good news. So we talked at the beginning, when there's good news, there's joy, and you just want to share that good news with others around you. But there's different perspectives on what is considered good news. What the Apostle Paul is communicating in verse 3 is that the gospel is for everyone. The good news is for everyone. It's only hidden from those who refuse to believe. Now let me pause before I move on and just give you an example of this. Sometimes you might think, this is really good news. I had some really good things happen. I'm excited. I got a great mark at school. And somebody else might be like, well, that's no big deal. I, I got that. Or, or I know somebody who, who got like 99 out of 100. And I mean, you only had like 95 out of 100. So there's different perspectives on what is good news. Now I know that's an easy example and that's kind of a ridiculous example, but it's an example nonetheless. So let's jump back. The gospel is for everyone is where we're starting. It is hidden only for those who refuse to believe. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 15 to 16, the first part of verse 16 says this, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To those who are perishing were a dreadful smell, now there's a picture for you, of death and gloom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. So you are either smell like death or you're a life-giving perfume. How do you like that? Paul says to people who do not know God, uh, we are the kiss of death or the smell of death. But to those who are being saved, uh, it's like a nice cologne or a perfume. Let's move on again. Another passage, this time from 1 Corinthians. So we had 2 Corinthians chapter 2 there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. If you know Jesus today as your Lord and Savior and you're watching this message, the gospel is the very power of God at work in your life to save you. Praise God. If you're watching and you do not know or you have people in your sphere of influence who do not know Jesus, the gospel message, the message of the cross seems foolish to them. It seems ridiculous. Maybe a crutch even. 2 Corinthians 4.3, let me read this again. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only from people who are perishing. 
And I think when I read this verse, uh, I recognize, I can recognize it eats away at some of us when we hear it because it doesn't seem fair. How is it that some can see and others cannot see? How is it that some can receive and others cannot receive? Well, we know it's a work of the Spirit and it's by faith, but let's go there for a moment. Why is it that some can see and others cannot? There are so many different factors at work to say the least, but 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4 tells us a big one. Satan, who is the God of this world, some versions say the God of this age, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news because Satan has blinded them. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ who is the exact likeness of God because they've been blinded by the work of Satan around them and the world around them. So before you jump now, because I know this is our tendency, we want to jump to the next thing. I told you the devil made me do it. It's a good excuse. The devil made me, it's because the devil, I couldn't see it. I just didn't know any better. I want you to hear this. Each person is accountable for their own actions. Let's, uh, get, let me give you a simple example. If you cheat on a test and you get caught or you cheat on your taxes and you get caught because everyone else is doing it, you, so you might as well do it anyway. So it's okay. Why not try it? But that doesn't mean you're not accountable when you get caught. It doesn't matter who else is doing it. It doesn't matter what else is going on around you. You are still responsible for your actions. So if you're listening to this message today, see, it was Satan's fault. Listen, you are still responsible for your actions. And the gospel message, remember, I said this a few moments ago, is for everyone. The gospel message is for everyone. The challenge is the people who are ready to receive it, the spiritual condition of the hearts that are out there. Are they ready to receive it or not? Do they want to receive it or not? So there are realities, getting back to this, or forces at work in our physical world. Satan is the enemy of our souls. He does not want us to give our lives over to God. He does, he, <clears throat> he does not have anything good in mind for you or for me. He is literally the enemy of our souls. He doesn't want you to see the reality of who Christ is because he knows if you even just get a glimpse uh, that you'll want nothing to do with the life that he is promising you, the life that Satan is promising you. So I want to be really clear. So he doesn't want you to see the reality of who Christ is because Satan understands if you see even a glimpse of who Christ is, you're going to want nothing to do with Satan, with, with him. Okay? Does that make sense here today? I hope it does make sense. There. You, you don't want to know. He, does, he knows that then you'll see how much Jesus really loves you, how much Jesus has really sacrificed for you. One of the greatest challenges that would have faced people that Paul was writing to, the Apostle Paul was writing in that day to the Jewish, the Jewish people, one of the greatest challenges they would have faced was that saying yes to Jesus and recognizing him as the Messiah meant something. It meant they had to get rid of an old way. It meant acknowledging the old covenant or the old way of doing things was finished and gone. And so many of them and their families and generations were defined by those things. Does this sound even a little bit familiar? One of the greatest struggles I think people experience when, when they have the opportunity to come to know Jesus is it means that they must change how they live their lives. Even though they know, many people know their lifestyle is less than ideal, they still like some of the things in their life so much so that they're blinded to the better things that God has in store for them. It's possible as you're watching this today, you're like, well, I know God has been speaking to me, but, but there's just something. I don't want to give this up. I don't want to give this piece of my life. I just like it. And the truth is we like what we know. We like some things, even though we know it falls short, even though we know there's something better intrinsically up here and in our hearts. I mean, that's the void that's there. We, we sometimes have a struggle to give it up. We've been blinded uh, to the things that maybe we have accepted to be as part of our lives. We need to know this, that Satan is the great deceiver. The Bible calls him the father of lies in John 8, 44. He will do whatever it takes to keep you in the dark or to keep you spiritually blind. And he does that over uh, for every one of us. It can be so difficult to see hope break through when it seems like so many people are content with living in darkness rather than experiencing the light and the love of Jesus. That might have been your story. That was my story at a time. And you might wonder, how could people not see it? How can people not see God in the world around it? It's because people have a different perspective on what is good news. They see things differently than we see things. 
As we uh, begin to wrap up here today, does this passage contain anything that can help us reflect God's love and share the good news? How do we show God's glory this summer? How, how do we share the good news of the gospel that we've heard about when some people seem to be blinded and they don't even want to see and they refuse to, to see? They might even know they need to see, but they like where they're at in their life right now. The Apostle Paul reminds reminded his audience in that day, and I believe by extension us today, is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 5 and 6. You see, we don't go around preaching ourselves, Paul says. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus. Early in the message, we learned that there are different perspectives on what constitutes good news. We discussed how some people have the veil removed while others do not. Others seem to allow or want or long or desire to keep the veil over their eyes. Some choose not to respond to the gospel message. So where does that leave us? What can we do? Is there anything we can do? How do we live our lives in light of the fact that we want to see people know the truth of the gospel and yet they don't want it? Well, here's our responsibility. There's more we could talk about, but I'm just going to focus on these two. The call is for us to focus on Christ rather than ourselves. True preachers or ministers of the gospel do not preach themselves. We read a few moments ago. They don't draw attention to how awesome they are. Instead, they point people to how awesome God is. Hard stop here today. Sometimes even in Christian circles and and in this world where everybody is looking to be a celebrity and everybody is looking to be lifted up uh, as a celebrity, even we see around us celebrity pastors at times. It's our desire should be never to draw attention to how awesome we are, but instead how awesome God is. To confess Jesus Christ is Lord means that a person is relinquishing all power and control to Jesus. Jesus is Lord means that you are no longer Lord over your life. I'm no longer Lord over my life. Instead, they are ceding control of their own lives and giving it over to Jesus. Our job is to focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on on Jesus this summer, not yourself, not personalities, abilities, or even achievements. You can get lost in all of those things. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. You see, recent news about moral failures reminds us that it is Jesus we must fix our eyes on, for he is the author and perfecter of our faith. It's not somebody we follow out there in the media. It's not somebody else that we do. It is Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Let your light shine is the other thing uh, that I want to focus on just before we wrap up. Let your light shine. Let your light reflect God's light. Ask yourself before you do anything this summer, does this magnify, let my light shine or reflect God's light before people, or does this hinder? Is the, what message am I sending by the way that I live my life, by the words that I'm speaking, by the things that I'm listening to, by the, by, by the places I find myself? God commanded light to shine in the darkness. And just as Jesus said, I am the light of the world, this should inspire you and I to be reflectors of God's light to a world that is so full of darkness. You see, darkness can't dispel darkness. Neutral doesn't mean moving forward. Neutral means just that. You're kind of neutral. You're kind of standstill and probably actually moving backwards. Light dispels darkness. Let's read Matthew 5, 14 and 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Your light must shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So for those watching and you know Jesus today, your light should shine this summer. You should be reflectors of the glory of God, that that people, when they look at how you live your life, by the look at the things you say and how you react to situations, will glorify the Father who is in heaven. The passage that we looked at today should be a reminder of the hope and the encouragement we have that despite the different challenges we may face, the problem has never been with the gospel message. It's for everyone, but rather the issue or the problem is the spiritual condition of people's hearts. 
probably uh, it's worth saying both those tasked with sharing and reflecting God's glory and also the hearts of those who need to receive it. Some people we love right now may uh, be choosing not to follow Jesus at this time. Let me give you these words from our first week's message uh, a few weeks back. Do not give up or lose heart. You might be within earshot of this message and think that following God is foolish or not quite enough for you just yet. But the only thing that I know to do here today is to tell you the truth and to love you. I'm not here to argue you and I'm here to present the truth to you because I love you, because I care for you. I may not know you personally, but I love you. I know that every person who knows Jesus has a responsibility to share and show God's love. And I take that responsibility serious here today. And that's what I'm doing. And in so doing, when we share and show God's love, we're mirroring what Jesus did for us. Focus on Jesus. Let your light shine before people in your circle of influence. But here's the reality. You can't do this by trying harder. You do this by resting in who Jesus is. We can't do this without God's help. That's the gospel truth. We need to submit ourselves to his ways and plans. We need to be people who say, God, I need your help. I can't do this on my own strength so that we can reflect who you are and we can show your light and your love to a world that is so lost and hurting. And let's just begin with doing it today. How about we do it this summer? How about we take small steps in the right direction. How about we be people who walk in obedience to what God's word says so that we can reflect, that we can mirror, so that we could amplify God's magnificence to a world that so desperately needs it. That's my prayer for you today as you watch this message. Let's wrap up. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us Lord, we recognize that some people don't see what we call good news as being good news. Some people think good news is them getting to do whatever they want to do and living life their own way. But God, good news comes from you. I thank you that the gospel message is the power of God at work to save lives. I recognize today, God, that I couldn't save myself and I needed you. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to live, die, and then rise again on the third day then to ascend to heaven after appearing to many of the disciples and then 500 people. Lord, it's so incredible for us to hear this today and it, it astounds us. And I pray, God, that we would be people who would take seriously our responsibility. So my prayer today is for those who are watching this message and, and uh, they know you and they love you, I pray that they would focus on you and let their light shine before others, that they would reflect, that they would share the good news with others. They would share it in such a way in humility, but they would speak the truth in love to those who are around them in their sphere of influence. To those who are watching this message, and they might think that the gospel message is foolishness. We read about that today. They don't see it as good news. I pray, God, that you would remove the veil. I pray that the blinders would stop and they would see the truth, that they would see that they have been blind. And Lord, they would see that that they have the opportunity to see and now they can see. Lord, I pray you'd reveal, speak deeply to each heart and each mind as they listen to this message in Jesus' name, amen. May God richly bless you and I pray you have an incredible week being reflectors and showing God's love, being reflectors of God's glory to a world that is so desperately in need of a Savior. I wanna take a moment to say thank you for those who've continued to support Cornerstone with their prayer and generous support. Without your help, we wouldn't be able to continue doing what we've been able to do over these last number of months. I would also ask that you would take some time to follow, like, subscribe, and share so that we can reach more people with the truth of God's word.